Good morning. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the program committee and the leadership of the uh, cancer committee for giving me the opportunity to present the really tremendous accomplishments uh, in Wilms tumor therapy over the past several decades. Um, I'm also hoping to highlight the pivotal role the pediatric surgeon has played in those accomplishments over the years. Um, so I'd like to start with a case to sort of highlight the progress that we've made. Um, the patient's a four-year-old male that had favorable histology Wilms tumor. Uh, there was tumor extension up to the atrium, as you can see here. The patient had stage four disease with a met metastatic lesion in the lung. He was known to be, uh, shown to be a rapid responder and uh, also was LOH negative at 1P and 16Q and had no evidence of 1Q gain. So in the 1950s, this patient would have a 100% mortality. In 2019, this patient has a five-year event-free survival of 88% and an overall survival of 92%. So how did we get here? So the tumor is named after Max Wilms, a German pathologist and surgeon who published this textbook in 1899, essentially um, showing that the tumor cell of origin is something that's found during the development of the embryo and fetus. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the title of the textbook, uh, but essentially it translates to mixed tumors of the kidney. The first reported treatment of Wilms tumor was in 1916. This occurred at Cincinnati General Hospital. It was a four-year-old boy with a large Wilms tumor who was considered a hopeless case. Uh, he, was, he received several treatments of radiotherapy, and they saw a marked reduction in the size of the tumor. The child, unfortunately, of course, died, um, but it did show that uh, radiotherapy may have some uh, effectiveness later on in the treatment of Wilms tumor. Surgery was recognized uh, early on as the first effective treatment for Wilms tumor, but the operative mortality was quite high. Dr. William Ladd presented his uh, outlines for the surgical principles for treating Wilms tumor, the radical nephrectomy, and by sticking um, and adhering to these uh, concepts, he actually was able to show for the first time some reportable survival in Wilms tumor. He reported 31%. Prior to that, the best survival was in the single digits. So this was the first step towards finding treatment for Wilms tumor. Fast forward now to the 1950s. Sidney Farber um, was experimenting with chemotherapeutic agents and uh, identified a number of them that had activity uh, in animal studies. He started using them in patients. And he published in 1966 on the effect of chemotherapy in Wilms tumor. He was using dactinomycin at the time of surgery along with radiotherapy. Um, he stated in that article <coughs> regarding chemotherapy, the assumption was made that the clinical agent carried throughout the body by the bloodstream might destroy small foci of tumor before solid implantation and further growth could take place. His results were staggering. 89% disease-free survival at two years. The previous best reported results were 40%. He more than doubled that. 58% survival of patients with metastatic disease. Previously, there, were no reported, there was no reported survival in patients with metastatic disease. Shortly after that came the National Wilms Tumor Study Groups. Their first meeting was in 1968, and they enrolled their first patient in 1969. Over... 30 years, they had five large studies. The group was led initially by Giulio D'Angio. It was very multidisciplinary, and everybody's opinion was valued. The initial surgeons were Harry Bishop, Lucian Leap, and Willard Goodwin. You just saw us uh, pay tribute to H. Beeman Otherson. He was uh, very involved in NWTS uh, 2 and beyond, and uh, he stated regarding the mission of these studies. The plan was to develop therapy which could be implemented in a systematic and randomized fashion with standardized protocols. The outcomes could then be studied in order to determine the best therapy for children with Wilms tumor. All in all, they treated almost 10,000 patients across these five studies, which is amazing considering the incidence is only about five to 600 per year in North America. What did they find? They basically determined what, what to treat Wilms tumor with how long to treat it for, and what to treat stage per stage. They also were able, by the mid-1990s, to show a survival of over 90% for Wilms tumor. 
At a very similar time in Europe and other places around the world, the International Society of Pediatric Oncology formed. They enrolled their first patient in 1971. What's very interesting about this, and I didn't realize this until I started looking into this stuff, the, we all know they treat Wilms tumor upfront with chemotherapy. That was actually a philosophy in place from their inception. The very first paper they published was on the use of radiotherapy um, for Wilms tumor, and they reported on how there was a reduced rate of intraoperative spill. The next study, which I showed here, is, was that that showed preoperative chemotherapy also reduced the rate of intraoperative spill and reduced the number of patients that required um, radiation. What's very interesting, these, looking at PSYOP and NWTS, COG, you, you can see that it's just a sophisticated way to demonstrate there are a number of different ways to treat disease and still have excellent outcomes. So the patient that I presented earlier on had tumor thrombus up to the atrium. The question, you know, that was, was obvious here to, that needed to be answered is what do you do about those patients? So Dr. Robert Schamberger in 2001 published on that. He reviewed cases in NWTS4 and found that really the hepatic veins were the key. Tumor thrombus above the hepatic veins, if you try to operate on that up front, the complication rate was higher and the complications were more severe. Therefore, but with tumor thrombus below the hepatic veins or just in the renal vein, those patients did very well with upfront resection. So I mentioned over 90% survival. How do you improve on that? So you have to find subgroups of patients that are not doing poorly, that are in that 10% that are not doing well. And so biology is obviously very important there. It was suggested that LOH at 1P and 16Q in previous studies um, was important. So in NWTS5, they prospectively looked at that and identified that certainly for higher stage patients that had combined LOH, there was, uh, uh, they had worse outcomes. Here, it, the four-year event-free survival was 66% for those patients. By comparison, if they didn't have LOH, 91% for stage three and about 80% for stage four. So they took this subgroup, increased therapy on the next COG trial, and they were able to increase the, the event-free survival by 30%, up to 96%, just by recognizing the, those markers of uh, poor outcome. Um, another way you can improve outcomes is by trying to decrease therapy for patients who don't necessarily need that level of therapy. So um, NWTS 1 through 4, there was a group of patients that no matter what we gave them, they did wonderful. They had over 95% survival. So they took that group of patients in NWTS 5 and called them the very low risk group. You can see who they are here. And essentially just treated them with surgery alone. What's interesting is they actually stopped the trial early because the event-free survival or the relapse rate was actually unacceptably high early on. Of course, they continued to follow those patients and saw that the salvage rate was higher than was expected. So the overall survival was still 98% for those patients. On the next COG trial, the overall survival for those patients was 100%. So what, you've, what they showed here, what Dr. Schamberger and uh, uh, his group showed here, was that you can avoid chemotherapy for a majority of patients with a maintenance of uh, excellent overall survival. Um, another important question to answer was the patient with lung mets. So you have a patient with lung mets, they get chemotherapy, the lung mets are gone. Do you still radiate their chest? This is an important question because the late effects trial showed that 15% of patients with Wilms tumor, 15% of female patients with Wilms tumor will develop invasive breast cancer before age 40. So if you can not radiate the chest, it's obviously a very good thing. So those are called rapid complete responders, the ones who respond in the first six weeks. Um, the four, by, even after limiting radio, eliminating radiotherapy for those patients, they still had a four-year event-free survival of 80%. The incomplete responders, they actually took the, that to be a surrogate for uh, a, a bad acting tumor, and they actually increased therapy for those patients. And in that group, we're able to show a three-year EFS of 88%. To compare the most recent NWTS trial where they got standard chemotherapy and all patients got lung XRT, the four-year EFS was 75%. So by reducing therapy for one group and increasing therapy for another group that seemed to have worse disease, they actually were able to improve survival for both <coughs> groups and limit radiotherapy. Um, the final study I want to discuss today was actually the first prospective study on bilateral Wilms tumor. So uh, Dr. Ehrlich spearheaded this uh, trial, and essentially what he noticed was that um, bilateral Wilms tumors had much worse uh, survival numbers than the, their unilateral counterparts. 
So the four-year EFS was 56% for bilateral Wilms tumor, even, even though many of them have favorable histology. One other thing that was noted was that there's no standard duration of, there was no standard duration of preoperative therapy. There was no standard therapy itself. Some of these patients received almost one year of chemotherapy before going to surgery. So what they found by, simply by standardizing management was a four-year EFS of 82% up from 56, and that 84% of patients were able to have surgery by week 12. One thing that we can do better on is that there was only 39% of patients that had bilateral nephron sparing surgery, meaning parts of both kidneys uh, were left behind. So what are our future directions? We've obviously come a long way. We've done wonderfully with Wilms tumor, uh, but there's, there's obviously more room uh, to go here. We are hopefully can um, expand the very low risk Wilms tumor group, the surgery only group. We need to standardize lymph node recommendations and prospectively collect outcome data on that. There's still a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the number of nodes that are taken and where they're taken from. One Q gain, which I didn't really touch on, it seems to be a very powerful predictor of outcomes, so there's a lot more to do in terms of studying that. Uh, and with bilateral Wilms tumor, as I said, we, we really need to improve our rate of nephron sparing surgery, uh, and we need to look at the biological factors as well in bilateral Wilms tumor. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today.